Welcome to Story Talk, a roundtable discussion of a single story at a time. Story Talk is a production of One Week Critique, an Iowa based arts and education nonprofit that offers educational resources and editorial support to students and teachers of the literary arts. You can learn more about us and our programs or support our work by visiting our Patreon page or by going to our website, oneweekcritique.com. That's the number one, weekcritique.com. I'm Matthew Schmidt, here with Ingrid Wensler. Hi. And Adam alistair Gain. Hello. Today we'll be discussing Call My Name by Amy Bender, a story from her 1998 collection, The Girl in the Flammable Dress. The narrator, a rich woman, holds secret auditions for men. She rides public transportation in an expensive dress, asking men questions. Deciding to pursue a shy man, she meets on the subway, an unusual afternoon unfolds. So that's the you know basic premise of the story. Um, I, I thought we would start with the narrator. Who is she, and how would you characterize her motivations in the narrative style of the story? Yeah, I think the narrator is a uh, the millionaire daughter of a uh, an inventor of the. Um, wall hooks um, why that word couldn't come to mind um, and she is she's hanging out she's moving through San Francisco and giving auditions to men I mean essentially because she's Randy right like and because there's also some kind of power that she gets out of like feeling attractive to these men and feeling like they have to come to her and she's giving them something in their day by presenting herself. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's a good, quick um, summary of who she is. I, I would also describe her as kind of um, quirky and eccentric, as kind of like proud of her whimsical way of moving through the world. Um, you know, as you said, sort of like in need of attention. Um, I think in terms of, I, I'm really interested in um, in her motivations and how they play out in the course of the story. Um, I, I pulled a few quotes that I, I think kind of point nicely to um, some of what she's looking for from, from these men and just kind of personally. Um, one is, I can't tell you exactly what I'm looking for, but I'll know it when it happens. I want to be breathless and weak, crumpled by the entrance of another person inside my soul. I want to be violated by insight. Um, I think tonally, um, especially in the context of some of the narrator's um, antics, I, this lands um, very humorously in the story and... Um, you know, it's it's at once genuine, but it's got this playful quality to it as well. Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think crucially, I see her as someone who's kind of looking, looking to learn about herself from how other people see her and from what they have to say to her. And yet she, she has very strong opinions about you know, whether what people say about her is accurate, is insightful. Um, there's this, as, a, as Adam said, like an auditioning aspect um, to these encounters. And, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting thing to do, I suppose, in that, um, you know, we're all social. We all live in the world, of course. Of course we learn about ourselves through other people and through interaction. Um, I think her particular way of like reaching for insight from someone else is, is what feels unusual there. Um, there's another line, she's talking about a, a man who's very tall here, um, who she's been kind of eyeing up on the subway. And she says this of him, his death eyes crinkle up in a wise way and I almost want to chase after him, have him look down on me with that look and tell me something brilliant about myself, unveil my whole being with one shining sentence, but there's really no point. Um, 
so you know another instance where she's looking to someone else to gain access to her own identity and person um, and crucially <laughs> um, you know I, th I think Bender is very playful this way um, the man is literally tall so um, you know the look down on me moment comes from like the literalness of height but um, there is a way in which, like, in both of these quotes I've pulled, in the first one, she wants to be violated by insight, and in the second one, she wants to be looked down on. So it's interesting. I think she wants at once to be, this is getting a little ahead of myself and thinking out some of what plays out in the story, but, um, you know, I think she wants to be elevated by the insights of others but also look down on and that tension is some of what makes the story really interesting yeah i think it's really apt in that like it's apt to like recognize that she's in the process of learning um yeah i also want to side apologize for the ambience it's winter in iowa and unfortunately we can't quite fend back all of the noise of the snow plows going outside <laughs> uh, but um Anyway, the first sentence of Call My Name is actually, I'm spending the afternoon auditioning men. She understands herself to be doing that. I think yeah. that one thing we haven't mentioned is that she doesn't give her age. She does say that the other main character of the story, she estimates to be about 10 years older than her. Um, I presume that she's fairly young, um, probably like early 20s. I do too. And I think that in part because the narrator is, she has a self-awareness about her place in the world and who she is, and in some ways how fortunate she is to not have to do things like work or strive, etc. And she's still sort of experimenting with her own sexual power and her financial power in the world. And it excites her in a way that I think most people who have accustomed themselves to those things um, have settled in their minds a little mm. bit better than she has. And part of that comes in, I age her by her overstatements in some ways, <laughs> um, right? She goes into a shoe store stalking this man at one point after she's gotten off of the train to follow him and she says this is a lame shoe store um, and she goes on to like have thoughts about the shoe store she actually tells um, a <laughs> a person working at the shoe store that a shoe that she's picked up being a bestseller is not a good selling point for me and then proceeds to say and you have lipstick on your tooth um, in a kind of dismissive way, she's later going to have a couple of other sort of like internal thoughts where she's fantasizing through things, but right, she's walked into this man's apartment. She is self-conscious enough, including about herself, to know that she prefers to walk in and like present that confidence. She doesn't put it in that way. It's something I'm assuming to say, but she states that she prefers to walk in than to knock. Right. Um, and then taken aback by the sort of failure of this man to just feel lucky. She says, I wonder if he's feeling lucky. I mean, how often does a beautiful girl follow you home and come into your house? That's lucky. That's what guys wish for. There's something both very overstated and like entirely incapable of processing how profoundly strange it is for someone to walk into your home and why you would be suspicious of all of this. Um, and I think that's something that the story has been to continue to negotiate. And I think Ingrid, you're right to point to that, that need of an external party to validate and that external party to inform who am I and what do I do with these feelings and, needs and why why am I not getting what I need yeah actually um you know Matthew had asked about narrative style as well and I think to that that in some ways is my favorite question about this story because um 
you know, I, I, I do my best reading fiction to pay a lot of attention to perspective, partly because um, it doesn't come naturally to me. I like to just kind of fall into a story and um, not pay too much attention to technicality. But um, I think technically this one um, is so breezy and so easy to read, but um, it's actually um, working something kind of complicated, I think. Um, so in terms of perspective, um, it's told in first and one thing that I think a lot about when I'm trying to understand how perspective is working is at what point, I think about temporality basically, at what point is this being told? And is that locked down throughout the story and does it shift? And in this story, um, I would say that it's in first and it mainly feels like we're getting the present tense story. Um, there are moments where I think, oh, this is just open-ended enough that maybe this could be coming from a different vantage point, from out of some sort of retrospective knowledge. There's also something very weird and interesting that Bender does, which is um, instead of inhabiting um, this woman in first and her thoughts in a more usual kind of, I operate usually in close thirds, so I, I think of like being in the head of the character and, you know, reported thought, so a, a thought that would be flagged with like she thought, I thought, um, or, um, you know, something closer to like free and direct where you just get the language of the thought. And here, that, that's not what happens at all. In fact, it feels all the time like she's addressing you, the reader. Um, I'll, I'll give a quick example because I think it's, it's pretty obvious on the page. Um, the men are pleased when I come on the subway because I'm the type who usually drives her own car. I'm not your average subway girl wearing black pants and reading the novel the whole time, so you can't even get eye contact. Me, I look at them, I smile at them, and they love it. I bet they talk about me at the dinner table. I give boring people something to discuss over corn. So, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, these could be thoughts that she's thinking. It's not in the language of thought. We don't get the I thought there. Um, in fact, like she's telling us the whole time who she is. Um, and I think technically that's really cool. I think the other thing that this story does in terms of narrative style that's fascinating to me is I think it's a story that asks really serious, profound questions, but that stylistically manages to stay really like fun and funny and, you know, at the moment that it starts to dig in and say something really serious, it very quickly pulls away. So, you know, you get problematic things about, like, how this woman, um, say, like, treats this, this girl at the shoe store, um, her brusqueness, um, her sense of privilege. But then the story quickly reverses, and it just, it really wants to, you know, engage these moments, but also not totally ground itself either in realism or in these serious questions. Yeah, I think that I do um, I do have certain doubts that were meant to, and this is an effect, by the way, I think of the conversational tone. I have doubts that the story is actually meant to be told in the sense that this narrator is speaking to someone. And part of the reason I have that doubt is that though it does feel very conversational and mm -hmm. we're, um, and that like even the embarrassing things that are being told, right? There's a moment at the shoe store where the girl keeps coming back to her sort of wealth and a lot of her sort of presentation she likes to she mentions early on in the story that she's not into cars and you know other like manifestations of wealth her mother isn't into spending at all but she likes 
fancy dresses and part of the appeal of the fancy dress is the presentation to other people but i think also we're going to see throughout the story the ability to sort of demonstrate affluence by not caring so much um but in the shoe store she has this sort of conversational statement about that i can imagine her sitting down and having a drink with me and telling me where she's going to buy maybe someday she will buy 14 pairs of shoes and then she takes that daydream off into the air by thinking that she wouldn't buy shoes from this lame shoe store but that she might buy them for homeless people and so she's going to buy these very comfortable shoes and she comes to this sort of you know comically stupid idea that the reason homeless people would want so many shoes is that they must get tired of wearing the same ones all the time. Um, and I can imagine that being said. Um, there are moments like late in the story, she actually plots out the idea. She's thinking forward in time. Um, and when she's thinking in forward in time, she thinks about going into a store and buying a new dress once her dress is destroyed. Mm -hmm. And she thinks about how that interaction is going to go. So she's fantasizing forward, which makes me feel like, in fact, this is all happening in real time in her mm -hmm. head. And I also think that because she plots the idea in her own head of how she's going to tell the story so as to not have to admit that she doesn't have sex with the man. And while that could be something that you would tell to a friend, I think both of those actions, and it's that late in the story before I feel certain mm -hmm. that I'm, yeah. this story isn't being told to me, but rather I'm in her present tense mind in some way. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like that because we're not, the text isn't in the present tense. It does feel immediate because of the way that she's speaking to me up to that point, or it feels like speaking to me. And I think that's a really subtle effective use of that mindset that also in rereading this text made me go oh shit yeah like now that i know that like she's doing this i'm seeing how in fact like all along there's this incredible amount of anxiety and kind of youthful inability to face what she's dealing with that deepened the story for me as a result sort of retrospectively I think that's a, a wild and cool trick of the, the writing there. Yeah, well, I mean, one of my favorite parts is uh, when she's in the apartment with the shy man. Uh, you know, she walks in and he looks at her sort of amused, not surprised. Persistent dress lady, he says. You are one persistent cook. <laughs> I love being called cookie. I love it. I love it. And and that to me is is just a, a hilarious part. And and so that brings me to the shy man. And we're calling him the shy man because he's not given a name. Um and so the first man that uh, Ingrid talked about is a tall man. And that's the only other man that she auditions for this story before settling on the shy man. Yeah. So I'd like it if you could just give us a little bit about what we understand of the shy man in the story. What's his deal? Um, at the beginning when they're on public transportation, he's really unresponsive and hardly says anything and just tries to ignore her. He walks off really quickly when uh, they get off the subway and you know, only when he's cornered by her in his own apartment does he really start talking to her. But his response isn't maybe what you would expect. Yeah, I think that um, the shy man is the shy man to her because she's, the narrator is being really forward. And she clearly expects people, right? Like she expects to impress the men that she's auditioning. She 
I think auditioning is an interesting term, right? In the way that like you want to be selected by someone's given you an opportunity to like perform in some way. And so you're going to perform and they're going to give you a part as it were. Right. Um, the shy man is not interested in auditioning, which is what makes him shy. Um, and in fact, right. Like, I don't know when he starts to think this, but she presents herself so aggressively to him. Uh, we don't hear him like say this until they're in the apartment. He wonders if she's a sex worker and she actually thinks that's exciting because it rather than insulting her has like given her the idea that at least sex is on his mind. And I think she's thinking that through because she hasn't figured out why at this point he's already encountered her on the subway. She's following him into the shoe store. Right. Um, so, I mean, like, we don't know why he's uninterested in sex with this woman or why he's not like going to be like engaged by her if he can avoid it. And I think there's too many reasons to not be interested to like speculate too heavily. The story doesn't give us that. What we do know about him is that like he's a little standoffish or he's a little like not interested in communicating off the bat that he's actually unusually calm, right? If someone were stalking me regardless of who they were and walked into my apartment, I'd be very nervous. Um, he's interacting with her on this very like calm, factual level. She walks into the house. He asks her these questions. He's already taken off his shirt. Um, she becomes really preoccupied with his nipples, which will come back a couple times throughout the story. When she continues to pursue like getting attention, he eventually agrees to, well, he says that he wants to like cut off her uh, dress and after cutting off her dress, he lets her know that he doesn't want to touch her or isn't interested in that. She's puzzled by that. She continues to pursue that. He ends up belting her to a chair. She thinks that's going to turn into a sex game, and it doesn't. Um, and so I think that, like, those are kind of... I mean, he's very flat. He sits down. I kind of imagine him as an old roommate of mine who like would come home after work and like immediately start drinking whiskey on the couch without a shirt and just stare at the TV. And that's, um, I mean, I think there's so many unknowns about him. He's clearly right. Like she makes a big deal about the smallness of his apartment that he hangs up his one t-shirt um, or the t-shirt he took off on one of the hooks of her father's, which I think is Bender both alluding to how the father got rich, but it's also a signal that in some way he isn't right. Like there's something neat or organized about him in his own way. Um, but I don't know. I don't know that much about the shy man, which I think is part of the mystery of it. And part of the appeal of him in the story is that the narrator is trying to be confident about what, men want and what other people want and the shy man's just sort of flat neutrality whatever's gone on in his life he's capable of rolling with these particular punches and is self-assured enough to make his own choices and not be persuaded to do things he doesn't particularly want to do um, maybe he just really likes aggravating this woman. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. I have a lot of questions about him, but in some ways I think he functions so much as a, a vehicle for her unknowns and what she doesn't understand. And part of that's the effect of, I think that what I was trying to say about the story being in her head that, and how I realized that, especially on second read, that she's never turning to me and going, what the hell? Um, but rather, it's just trying to process the, someone who can not be responsive. Yeah, I think um, I think you're so right that um, he's he's difficult to access because we get 
him through her and him through her in the present tense moment. You know, she's processing what's happening to her as it happens. And she's also, I, I think actually, <laughs> um, like you were saying before, I think she has moments um, where she's unusually aware and others where she's, you know, exaggerating and generalizing and um, leaning into her own quirks. Um, I think I think it's interesting thinking about is he shy when we first meet him. First of all, because yeah. um, he's dubbed the shy man, so I I kind of accept that at first. Um, and I think what I would say about him is. He doesn't say a lot, um, but he seems to be thinking about what he says, and it doesn't surprise me that this is the man of the two that she's auditioned, that she follows. Um, we find out with the beanpole, the first guy she's auditioning, that she's trying to make sense of whether he likes cats or dogs. Um, so she runs the same question by the shy man. And what he says is, I prefer whichever turns around when you call its name. Um, she also has a moment with him earlier where in, we get in her head, I can smell my shampoo, which smells like almonds. She's asking him at this point about what subway stop he's going to get off at. And he answers her. Uh, he says, Powell. And he also says, your hair smells like almonds. Yeah. So we know about her that she's she's looking for someone who's going to tell her about herself, right? right. Um, here's someone who notices something about her um, and who answers a question unusually um, in a way that seems, I think, to speak to, you know, her own Id idiosyncrasy, how she might think about the world. This seems like the kind of mystery that would intrigue her. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think like you, Adam, I, I have a lot of questions about him and his motivations, definitely. Um, but I, I think I think I read him as mainly like calm, as, yeah. as someone who doesn't have to share every thought that's on his mind, um, you know, but who's looking at the world a little unusually or certainly acting a little unusually. Um, and I see him as mainly like amused by her. Um, and kind of, I mean, in terms of like cutting the dress and deciding not to touch her, um, in a way, like one question I want to pose for us to think about is, does he give her what she wants? I think he violates her with insight, but I don't know whether or not she receives the insight. Right. Mm -hmm. Like in some ways, the title, both of you hit on some like interesting quotations there and that like, we don't get that much from the shy man, right? Like there is something that he's thinking about his language. Like I've I spent a lot of time overthinking the question of like that double use of, you know, like my own head, like why would you like persistent? persistent like to repeat that at her mm -hmm. um and what why bender's chosen to let him like re-emphasize that what that says about him i don't have great con conclusions i'm gonna like skip over that thought but there's um right like he isn't shy in the way that i would understand shy. he doesn't shrink away from her and he does communicate with her and he even volunteers information to her. Um, and so he's, I mean, he's telling her, he's, I don't know if it's violating her with insight to like let her know because he doesn't know that she's calling him the shy man. Um, rather, right, like when she meets him, she recognizes that he's a smoker and tries to encourage him to smoke out the window of the train. Um, and she's trying to prove that she knows something about him. And I think in response, he does demonstrate to her, if that's that kind of like, I see something about you, he demonstrates to her that she's, she doesn't know all the things that she thinks she knows. In fact, like a lot of the things he says to her are 
oddly direct and like, mm. including just to share that her hair smells like almonds. Um, that isn't just an awareness of her. It's being brave enough to share an odd fact with her. Um, but also to say I'm familiar with the smell of almonds. Right? <laughs> sure. Um, sure, sure. Uh, so I don't, you know, I don't buy into her interpretations ultimately. And I think that's what he's teaching her. Uh, but I don't know if she knows that by the end. Um, I, I don't think the last lines get me there, but I think I'll probably come back to that. Mm-hmm. So uh, the quote that Anger just read about the animals, uh, about the shy man liking whichever animal turns when he calls their name, uh, you know, in some ways it speaks to the title, which is Call My Name. But my question is, why don't the characters get named? We've got talk about names. We've got this quote about names. Why aren't there names? Do you want me to jump in? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You look like you're still line. thinking. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a, you know, one, I'm sure of this kind of answer to this question. I don't think it's that kind of question, but, um, you know, it, it's certainly something that I note as a reader and something that I think about. Um, and, I mean, I think thinking about this character and imagining her, even though it doesn't get stated directly as someone a little bit younger and someone who's, um, you know, playing around with auditioning men, um, I think some of it is, um, you know, a cuteness giving someone like a nickname, um, but also, um, you know, perhaps to some extent like a resistance to the intimacy of a name as well. And I mean, I think um, watching this narrator get rejected in the way that she does and, you know, um, get toyed with in the way that she does. Um, I think identity is so much the thing that she's kind of lusting after and the thing that she wants to be appreciated for. Um, She wants those quirks seen and recognized. um, That I think, in a way, I, I read the... these names about like creating a familiarity between these characters, the intimacy of a nickname, but also at the same time, a distance. Um, There's something a little serious about calling someone by their name. And um, I don't don't know, I guess that's, that's, those are my initial thoughts on that. Yeah. You're looking at me like I'm a crazy person. No, I, I don't I don't think you're a crazy person. I think like in some ways, right, like exchanging names can be so profound, right? Like it's this small thing we actually do often, right? You meet someone, you introduce yourself, you work at the grocery store and you've got a little name tag that says, Hi, my name is so and so. And it's about creating a familiarity. But that kind of name creation also reaffirms something about us, right? Like often something that's about us before we had any capacity to name ourselves. Most of us don't change or fundamentally alter the names given to us by our parents, right? And something about this narrator has been given the sort of things that she thinks about herself by her parents, in this case, who are also unnamed, right? Her father who earned the money or at least acquired the money. Um, Her attractiveness, which is largely genetic, but we also learn, right, like that she's spending a lot of time, you know, trying to keep her stomach taut uh, with a bunch of crunches, Um, right? Right. And it's also decorated up by her very fancy dresses. Um, But I do think there's a tension between that, right? Like, I think there's something, right, like, 
anonymity in, I think, right, she's in an urban environment. She thinks about the millions of people on Market Street, right? Um, there's something so appealing about anonymity and that you can be anyone, right? Um, and try anything, and that's part of the process of learning who you are. Um, if you, right, there's always this obnoxious thing about encountering your family where they're like, remember that time that you did this thing that you wish you had never done and that we're going to think of as part of who you are forever and remind you about constantly because we think it's so cute that you were such a moron. Um, right? um, and, and that anonymity is appealing, I think, especially, I mean, I think part of the appeal of anonymous sex when we're young is often about Right, the possibility of learning about ourselves through trying things out. And that's also part of the horror of it because you can't quite learn some of those things without interacting with people and learning and knowing about them. Um, you can know plenty of cats and not know their names, right? And they might turn around if you call at them, but there's something very different to engaging the cat or the dog and maybe I'm landing back there because in the background, a very special cat's doing a little snoring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to comment too on the way in which the title works with um, what the shy man has to say about calling names. And I mean, that's something that like it gets me thinking in a way like that this is a reach. It isn't on the page at all, but. I started to think about, well, what if this story were titled Blast? Um, and that's what the narrator concludes, call my name. Like, I'd be the person who would turn around. Um, I, I don't know, just like a funny thought about reversal. But the way those things play with the, those moments play with each other sort of recursively is interesting to me. Yeah. It's also, I mean, it's, it's playing on that other trope about like the sexual calling of which is all about like sure. often right for whatever reason in literature and film comes up mostly as an infidelity thing it's like the accidental calling of the wrong name mm -hmm. right. speaking of sex the narrator really wants to have sex with the shy man as we've established and yeah. he refuses how are gender and socioeconomic roles subverted in this story. Yeah, I think the obvious one is that, right, the narrator is a female who's very actively pursuing men, and she, like, at one point mentions, right, like, she doesn't exactly know what she wants, but she thinks to herself that maybe having her dress around her ankles and, like, standing there naked in high heels is what she's been waiting for all day, um, or what she wanted to be doing day um i think also right like one thing she keeps coming back to i think this is the for me i i feel like i'm beating a dead horse about this for me this is a story about power and it's about learning what your power is and learning about the changeability of that power and i think it's such a potent thing for young women when they find the possibility of like the draw of sexuality. And I think this narrator has found that and is working through that and is shocked to find when she can apply it. Um, and that's, I think that's one subversion, right? She says that thing about what men want is like some attractive woman to like come right up to them. And she says that when it's feeling uncertain or the things are feeling uncertain, she's reminding herself of the stable world um, or what could be a stable world through gender expectations. The other is, right, like, she does that same thing when things feel threatening, right? That the irritation of being, like, disrupted by someone in their place of business makes her a little vitriolic to the shoe sales girl. Um, she also, right, when she's feeling rejected by the shy man, turns to thinking about the size of her bank account um, 
over and over and over that, right, like she assumes his desires. She assumes the, the idea that she can pull on those desires of, you know, wanting someone who's clearly wealthy, right? At one point he mentions it's sort of, you know, she doesn't describe it as shock. He just says to her that um, in question that she can replace her dress. You know, it doesn't bother her. She notes that. Uh, but also, once things are going poorly for her, she thinks about the ability to go in. She's going to, like, if he won't let her borrow his, you know, shirt, which she, as I noted earlier, notes that she's getting some of the residual money from because he's hanging his shirt on one of these hooks, that she might come looking like a lunatic into a place, but she'll know that they know they can take a bet on her because of the quality of the fabric um, and that kind of stuff, right? And I think the story does ask me to wonder to myself, like, why does he approach this the way that he approaches this? Is he, is he, I don't know, some Marxist type who just really sees her wealth and wants to aggravate her? Is he, like, you know, you know, I don't know, like, does he get off on, like, having someone desire him or not? Any of those questions ad infinitum. And, but I think the story, because she assumes those things, reminds me that I'm supposed to assume those things. And also because the story's in her head and she thinks of herself in the ways that she thinks of herself, leads me to believe on first read that, in fact, it's true that she's an attractive woman. That, like, it's true that any of these people she's going up to, you know, like, would want to have sex with her. It's true that they're going to go talk about her over a coin. Um, and it's not until I take a moment to step back and I go like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't know any of this. I know that. I also never think about girls specifically who are driving their own cars, but she makes claims about that. And I, I actually, because of the assertive way she's stating it on, like, first glance, go like, I guess there's, you know, something I like, I spent time thinking about that. Yeah. Um, I, I think you did wonderfully with this question. It's kind of a tough one. And I mean, I actually had this thought uh, reading this story that the story would be so difficult to teach in some ways. Yeah. I think the premise is, is so strange, but I mean, it so much does want to ask these questions about gender and socioeconomic rules and things that are outside of the story. And I think it, it would be so easy teaching it to, you know, end up thinking too much about what the story could have been if it were done a different way or about these, these ideas that are outside of the story and its events. Um, but they're so crucial to the story at the same time that you know, it's, I think it is important to step outside of the story and do some of that thinking as a reader. Um, one thing I thought a lot about um, is, you know, her specifically following him to the apartment yeah. and that being a private space traditionally. And I mean, even, even if, you know, you go on a date with a stranger and that date is in an apartment, um, the ways in which that could feel unsafe and the ways in which that is often gendered. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that the man, that the, there are reversals and there are ways in which this story smartly doesn't fully reverse. Um, like the man isn't afraid. Yeah. Um, and in fact, um, you know, when he chooses to cut off the dress, there's the question of knife and scissors. And it's the narrator who says, actually, knife is too much. Let's do scissors. Um, you know, I think the story wants to insist on that ridiculousness, but also is careful not to make itself only about questions of gender and socioeconomic reversals. Um, that would be a much less interesting story. Like it. It does insist on these zany moments as well and on its humor and such. Um, you know, I think 
This question also made me think a little bit about um, the timing and the ways in which dating has changed over time. Um, I, I have these family friends and their story of how they met is um, the woman is from South Africa and she came to um, the States and on her first day here she was walking past um, a bar where the man was sitting and he felt like he fell in love with her at first sight and you know had no way of reaching her so followed her home and stayed all night beneath her par apartment waiting for her <laughs> you know they're now married and have two kids um, but you know I mean like what an unusual way to meet what a story um, but one with like these creepy elements it all depends on that particularity and I think that's some of what this story is playing with um, you know there were moments in reading this story where I saw um, annotations um, I was owned by a student first um, where you know the students underlining something and saying so creepy and I'm like well actually like I'm laughing at this moment it doesn't feel creepy unless I ground it in a different situation yeah I think that one thing right like as you're telling that story, um, I think it's both, right? Like, it's one of those yeah. things that something horrifying <laughs> is happening. Exactly. Including, like, your family friend, like, married or not, that story is not cute to me. It's mortifying, right? <laughs> and, it, like, um, and I think it probably would have been Pre cell phone, you know, like, and I oh, think yes, that definitely. like definitely that's some the, of what I was thinking yeah, about the how this change changes based on you know when it's taking place. Yeah, and then like people take risks of different kinds and make choices of different kinds that sometimes end up working out for them, right? Like someone is doing something that is dangerous or creepy, and it like ends up manifesting in some way that isn't end result dangerous and creepy and sometimes that's part of why dangerous creepy stories feel romantic and trying right like if you ever watch sure. a rom-com most of the things that happen are so troubling uh, <laughs> that if you put them into real life they'd be unforgivable except for the fact that we have some kind of yeah i mean what resolution. about uh, i just saw sleep was in seattle for the first time and i mean basically it's a woman who's stalking a man who she hears tell his story on the radio. Yeah. Um, I think that most of this story is like, it's a, stories are safer spaces than most spaces because right. we know that this is fiction. We know that it's like absurd. The voice of the narrator is over the top. And so, you know, in the way that like a camera lens and film can like, you know, by shrinking or widening, make something feel more ominous or by the ambient noise or like diegetic noise we hear change the feeling. And the tone of the story feels a little chaotic and funny and over the top. Yeah. And so I don't really worry for her in part because she's telling me the story. So I assume she's not murdered. Um, but I think that also ends up amplifying mm. a lot of the things that happen in a way that like, there's both the realistic thing that is I'm reminded of by the scissors knife question. She brings it up. She asks him scissors or knife. And, you know, the kind of logical part of me is like, why the fuck ask him? Like, just tell him like, okay, but with scissors. scissors if that's what you need. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, no, I mean, both of their behavior like, is stressful in that way. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm thinking about her following strangers home and I don't do that. And <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I'm thinking about him and I'm like, well, I mean, if, if, if what you're doing is trying to teach her a lesson, like, is that really ethical? Is this the way to do it? I, I don't know. Couldn't you just talk to her? But it also brings up some of the tensions that, right, like ultimately she's going to get, I mean, they call it being tied up and it is being tied up, but it's, it's belted to a chair, right? And for some reason, right, like this man is hanging up his one dirty shirt, but in fact has at least three belts. 
which seems like a lot of belts to me, <laughs> but um, which is a sidebar. But there is, I think that right in that like, there's something about that kind of vulnerability that like is sexually appealing to a lot of people to be tied up to like engage in BDSM in different ways that like brings something out for people and that danger can bring something out in a very real way, which isn't like a lot of the rest of the story a little more dependent on age or, or like mentality or class, but that like there is an appeal to that being f afraid to her that, right? Like she's still, when this comes up, she's bringing it up and pushing for it and she still expects something to happen with them and it's not happening. I think the, the tone yeah, is I mean, I shifted by that. The funny thing is like even, even with her consent, even with her pursuing him, like if I'm taking the story literally and I'm not paying attention to the ridiculousness of it, um, it still really bothers me that he cuts open the dress. Um, like, I, I don't think, you know, if I were teaching, like, ethics, I would say, like, that's the move for you in this situation <laughs> to him. Um, and, I, you know, I, I don't know if that's me personally and my feeling about, like, what you can and can't do to a stranger and my my own notions of kindness and what's right, but um, I don't feel good about that. Yeah, but you're missing the ethically questionable or more than questionable fact that she's broken into his apartment. Oh, true. I mean, and, I'm not I'm not saying she's yeah. doing fine yeah. either. <laughs> and with caveats, she does consent, which is the other interesting thing, by the way. I think less about. Um, gender gender expectations but in fact like there's a lot of good practice in terms of like minus the breaking into his apartment where like questions are being asked nothing happens without permission here um and that's part of what's disturbing about it also is that like i i don't know that she's happy with the outcomes um and that there's something sort of there's something about despite all of that like conversation, there's there's a lot of missed signals and or disappointments. Uh, well, let's talk about that. Yeah. Who, who you know, this, this story has a narrator who wants something. Does she get what she wants? And the shy man who is involved in this story is given, you know, more power by the place that it takes place at, uh, you know, the fact that he outwardly, at least, doesn't want something uh, because he's already brushed her off and gone home. And the fact that he is seen as a danger uh, by the narrative at least to a certain respect. Yeah. And so, in a sense, right, it's a battle of, of wills within the apartment towards the end. So, does someone win? Uh, I think those are, are two different and two valuable questions about the story, both because of she states that she doesn't know what she wants, but that she's going to know it when she finds it. And she does come to that notion of winning at the end, which is a kind of joke on on the yeah. program they're watching she says i close the last line is i close my eyes and listen to the noise of winning fill the room yeah and i i think that there's i think she gets what she wants but maybe the story doesn't give us like the temporal experience of watching her have that realization um both because I do think the story is very close to in time, meaning that like we're living it with the narrator a little bit. Um, and because, right, like, I think maybe this is just my way of understanding the world. So like, you know, our experience in the world that like, so often someone tells me something in the moment, right? Like you're such and such kind of person and it disturbs me or it makes me feel proud or whatever. And I 
move toward that direction or away from that direction because it disturbed me or made me feel proud. And then later on I go like, well, that person knew me for a total of an hour and gave me no insight at all. And I've made a mistake in my own understanding because they said something assertively. Sometimes someone introduces me to something that I just reject um, or I don't want to experience or that I just disbelieve and I'm unconvinced of someone's wisdom and then 10 years later I'm walking down the road going like, oh shit, so-and-so is right that this was a better way to live or this is something true about me or so on and so forth. I think he's probably violated her with insight by like letting her encounter something about her own desires and I don't know whether that insight for her is ultimately like, in fact, I like this danger and I'm into that struggle, or if it's like, I in fact do not like this, or something much more subtle and complex over time as she grows. The story doesn't give me that, and I don't think it wants to give me that. Well, I think it gives you that she doesn't dislike. Yeah. Because he asks her, because they just watched TV. She's strapped to a chair. And, you know, naked. And he's sitting on the couch, yeah. not touching her. And they discuss what to watch. Yeah. And he asks her, you know, are you ready to go home yet? Yeah. And she says no. And they continue watching television. Yeah. And it might be also that, like, it might be that they both lose insofar as like, I don't know if this guy actually has a thing to do at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, I think it's like six o'clock at night. Oh. Yeah. I, or eight I, thought o'clock. It was, I thought it was six hours. But two yeah, hours. six hours. I think it's like two o'clock. Oh, it's eight right. o'clock. Yeah. Six right, hours right, from right. two o'clock. Yeah. Right. That's where my mind misremembered. I thought it was six hours until two o'clock. But um, I don't know if he actually has an appointment either way. That's the real point, right? Right. Um, and... I don't know if he has anything to do. I don't know if he has a date on the other end and that's what his thing is. Um, I don't, I don't know any of that. I don't know. Like I'd mentioned, there's this like suspicion I have that the story gives me only because she keeps thinking about the size of her bank account, etc. And that like he's enjoying disrupting this because he recognizes legitimately something that she wants which is to, like, exercise this, like, power over him. Um, I think in some ways she has allowed herself into his life. She's gotten something that does violate her, if not with insight, like, with a troubled, you know, shift in perspective. Um, And it might be that he believes that he's gotten what he... I mean, he got to cut off her dress, which is what he says he wants. If he's right about only wanting to cut off her dress, then, like, he's done that, and he's, like, there. if he wants to, like, disrupt her world or change her perspective or let her know that, like, well, I don't know if he's taught her a lesson that she shouldn't walk into people's houses anymore if that's what he wants or not, but because I don't know those things, it, it seems possible that they either both get what they want or neither of them gets what they want or that one of them gets what they want, and but I think that all plays out over the course of a a long haul that the story won't give me, but it does, I think, savvily provide me with all of those questions and all of those answers remain open to me. Yeah, I think... um, I thought similarly about the conclusion. Um, One thing that I spent time sort of mulling over was what are the sources of each character's power in the story? Um, So, I mean, I think in very close to the ending, after she's been tied up, um, the shy man says, lady, are you ready to go home? And we get this from the narration and the narrator. I'm thinking about the walk home. I have to go into one of the stores and buy myself another dress. I'll borrow one of his t-shirts, or if he doesn't let me, then I'll wrap the satin around me like a towel. The sales girl will note the strange outfit, but acknowledge the fineness of the material and decide I'm a good bet. 
She'll tell me her name and hang up my choices while I still browse around. Maybe I'll tell her the story of this dress, but leave it open-ended. And she'll giggle, for after all, I'm the customer. I'll take a cab home in a new, glorious, brocade, cream-colored gown. My apartment is big, and I have a big TV. I have a velvet couch, and it's one of a kind. I have cable. I have better reception than this stupid nickel man. I have a remote control that can work through walls. Um, you know, she's she's presented herself as as someone who has power because of her socioeconomic position. Um, in this moment where vulnerable, she's naked, belted to this chair, and rejected by this guy. Um, we see her reaching for her sources of power, um, for the ways in which she comes back to this a few times in the story, or she mentions this a few times in the story, the effect that she has on sales girls. Um, so, I mean, her power to buy, her power to be recognized as someone who, who can buy things. Um, and then as we move toward the ending, um, as Matthew points out, um, you know, he asks her, um, the shy man asks her if she wants to go home, and she tells him no. I don't want to go home yet. Is that okay? Um, so, I mean, she's still deferring to him here, and even in her own thoughts when she's reclaiming power, um, wondering if he'll give her a t-shirt. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, if we're reading her as winning and coming to the realization or the claim that she's won finally, um, I think what she seems to be thinking immediately is that she's won because she's chosen to be there now. Yeah. It's her choice. She's got agency back, even if she had to ask for that agency. Um, I think, though, like, Adam, you're so smart to reach back to earlier points in the story in terms of what she initially wanted before she was in this position in the first place, um, which is you know, to be violated with insight, to be opened up. Um, and I think that there is something to being shown a little bit about yourself by not getting what you want or getting some of what you want, but not all of it, and you know, understand, understanding something new about yourself that way. I think it's really interesting that um, one more moment that the story sort of luxuriates over in terms of like the physical scene is the cutting open of the dress. We get a lot of details about where the scissors are and how um, the scissors kind of run up the side of the dress and go to the sleeve and then around the other side. And um, because we stay on that for the length of time we do, I end up thinking of her like actually being sort of opened up. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think the story is thinking about those things, but, you know, I think it's really careful not to give definitive answers, and that, that's the thing I love about it. I love in that last line that I lean toward the interpretation, and I think this is what the story leans toward, that she believes she's winning. Yeah. Um, I love the way the line is constructed, though it leaves an openness in a way that the perspective does on first read where, you know, there's no subject attached to the winning. Um, so you do get to think about um, the shy man as having won something too. And um, I think like you, Adam, I thought about what he seems to want and what he gets and, I mean, He's very blunt about what he wants and doesn't want, even if he's navigating that as as things come up. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think he does get what he wants. Um, which is? Um, which is to cut open her dress and not touch her and watch TV. And why does he want that? Um, my read is that he's that he's teaching her a lesson of a kind um, and that he understands that 
sometimes not touching someone or not giving them what they want is a source of power going back to where I initially started this ramble in terms of sources of power. I think his is to some extent not wanting or not acting. Yeah, which is also, by the way, not inherently sexually neutral, Indeed. right? Like mm -hmm. that, in fact, that may or may not appeal as that kind of power. And I, I think that like... And I think the story is really doing something smart there too and that we don't get any cues there with regard to like whether this is turning him on. I think for, for me at least, if we had those cues, I would wonder less about his motivation and feel less engaged in the story finally, I think. Yeah, I think... I, I don't want to be pointed to one definitive answer there. Yeah, the only cue we actually get is the one time, right, it's that reference to, like, biting his nipples, which are fruit-like to her, and, like, her nipples, like, being not soft, and his nipples being soft, right? Like, the one time we get any, you know, like, apart from her just, like, worrying out that her breast has been exposed by the cutting of the dress and like him seeing it which seems to be a sort of like turn on for her but also like worry that he's not being responsive but we don't get the kind of physiological you know this isn't like penthouse letters we don't really like get there a ton of bodily action um, it does have wants though it's got oh for sure and I'm, you know, the, I think it's introduced, you know, very slightly in that the woman thinks and knows is correct that he wants to smoke when he's on the subway. Yeah. And in an interesting way, the way he smokes the cigarette while she's in the apartment, I think is very telling of who he is. And that he starts, he, he lights it. He takes like a puff or two and then puts it out. And later he just lights it back up again and has another puff and then puts it out. Yeah. Right. So I think you guys are right in pointing out the, you know, there's no one easy answer to any of these questions. And I think that's what makes the story really interesting, really fun. And it leaves you with, you know, a lot more questions than what you would think this simple, as far as plot is go is is, mm -hmm. is concerned, uh, one would expect. Oh yeah. So yeah, thank you for uh, talking about the story today. Uh, go check out some Amy Bender if you haven't. Fascinating stuff, and we will see you next time. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.